I had never heard of that. And when I got to UNC, a mentor recommended that I look into a certificate called the Certificate for Innovation for the Public Good. And I was really confused because I had no idea what that might mean. And so through that certificate, I've taken a few courses in human-centered design and social innovation, which ended up in me being a fellow for design thinking at Innovate Carolina, which is the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's Innovate space. And so essentially what I'm learning to do is how to apply concepts of design into solving complex social problems. And so what I really enjoy about it is that I mean, it's in the name human centered. It centers the voices of those experiencing um, whatever maybe problem or situation we're trying to address. And so um, one of my favorite examples is a method called storytelling or a storyboard. And so essentially what you do after speaking with a community to understand, you create a storyboard to share their story. And then you go back to the community and you're like, hey, what did you think about this? And they can say, no, you're not accurately telling my story. Or they can say, yes, that's exactly it. Or yes, that's great, but like shift this and this. And so I think that as public health practitioners, we have a responsibility to share and center community members and do that well. Welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm your host, Mario Richards, founder of the Public Health Millennial. We're going to dive deep into public health topics and career journeys. You'll hear diverse career stories, absorb professional development and career strategies, get tips while also learning from others to help you in your own journey and learning of public health. Learn about the vast world of public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories. Stay tuned so we can do our part towards a culture of health, well-being, and equity for all. Hey friends, welcome to Public Health Careers. On today's episode, you'll learn more about human-centered design and social innovation in public health, the importance of community, building community, leaning on community, as well as centering community. You'll also learn about why setbacks are just opportunities for growth, and you'll learn a great framework to think through how to think about your MPH work, as well as approaching mentors to really get the most out of your public health career, as well as much, much more. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you love the show and get some value from it. Leave a five-star review, share this with a friend so that they can also get value from it and can get the show out to more people and really help others to understand what they can do with public health and really navigate in their public health journeys. And if you'd like to support the show, there's a link below to either become a monthly contributor or a one-time contributor to the Public Health Millennial. So if that's something you're interested in, be sure to check that out, but be sure to share it with a friend that really, really helps and I really appreciate it and subscribe as well. Enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Otero Machuca, and I am a public health professional interested in human centered design, social innovation, and anti colonial community based methods in research to advance health equity. And you're listening to Public Health Careers. Today, we have a student and practitioner interested in community based innovative research solutions that center community voices and experiences in addressing barriers to experiencing optimal quality of life. She conferred a bachelor's in health education and behavior at the University of Florida. Go Gators. Go She's Gators. A current master of <laughs> Go Gators. She's a current master of public health candidate in equity, social justice, and human rights track at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, as well as works as an associate clinical research coordinator at the Mayo Clinic. We have Jessica Otero Machuca Chez. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. about once again but i didn't <laughs> i love it the, a great welcome a great welcome yeah my pleasure my pleasure i'm glad that uh, you can join join me today and uh, share more about your story and i, I love your intro and, and and hearing more about it and i'm looking forward to digging more into it and, and hearing about your perspectives so tell us how do you identify yeah i go by she her ella do you want to introduce yourself in spanish by chance Oh, sure. <laughs> eh, mi nombre es Jessica Otero, trabajo en salud pública, interesada en una innovación social y estudios centrados en la comunidad y estás escuchando Public Health Careers. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I love, love when I'm able to give people that opportunity. Yeah, no, thank you, I love it. Yeah, you're most welcome. And I, I know you, you said a lot in the intro there about yourself. And just to like start off everything that we're talking about, would you like to share more about human centered design and social innovation in public health? Yeah, so I had never heard of that. 
And when I got to UNC, a mentor recommended that I look into a certificate called the Certificate for Innovation for the Public Good. And I was really confused because I had no idea what that might mean. And so through that certificate, I've taken a few courses in human-centered design and social innovation, which ended up in me being a fellow for design thinking at Innovate Carolina, which is the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's Innovate space. And so essentially what I'm learning to do is how to apply concepts of design into solving complex social problems. And so what I really enjoy about it is that I mean, it's in the name human centered. It centers the voices of those experiencing um, whatever maybe problem or situation we're trying to address. And so um, and one of my favorite examples is a method called storytelling and, or a storyboard. And so essentially what you do after speaking with a community to understand, you create a storyboard to share their story. And then you go back to the community and you're like, hey, what did you think about this? And they can say, no, you're not accurately telling my story. Or they can say, yes, that's exactly it. Or yes, that's great. But like shift this and this. And so I think that as public health practitioners, we have a responsibility to share and center community members and do that well. And so I really love human centered design's capacity to do that. And then I'd say that's a part of social design, social innovation. And so within social innovation, um, I've also learned just really cool ways to apply innovation methods into public health. So, for example, problem mapping. Um, never would have thought to do that. But in thinking about a problem or a barrier that a community is facing, mapping that out of who's being impacted by the problem, who might be causing the problem, what factors are being contributed by this problem. and it seems a little matter of fact and things that we might do in our heads, but I've found that putting those things onto paper or sticky notes, whatever it might be, really helps to then ideate really cool pro uh, solutions and then be able to prototype them and see if they might be effective with the community, um, again, centering them. Love it. Love it. And I love, I love the idea of like the responsibility and like the storyboarding and creating that, that space to say, okay, this is what I kind of heard. Like, am I right? Am I, am I not right? What am I missing? What else do I need here? Um, Cause I think that that is very important. And I, I love the human center design part of anything that we're doing. And I feel like that should be the first way that we approach a lot of the work, but it, it, it isn't sadly. Uh, so, so I'm glad that you're getting experience in that and like centering that in the work that you're hoping to do. Uh, yeah. Hope, hope, thank you. That you are doing that. Let's not say hope. <laughs> to. And, and just tangentially, uh, what were any of those classes with Vici by chance? Yes. How do you know Vici? Uh, she, she is a grantee partner of, of mine. So I, I would, oh, okay. a lot of the work that I do is in Northeast North Carolina. So in rural North Carolina. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> closely with Vici. And Seth yeah. And yeah. That's great. Vici taught one of my courses. So I will say one of the greatest mentors I've had, um, especially in design thinking is Liz Chen, uh, who also taught this mm -hmm. course. And so they're both really awesome and taught me a lot. Well, that's awesome to hear. I actually yeah. just just recently got connected with Liz Chen, like through work to to do some stuff. Uh, so I'm looking forward to doing that. But like, I feel oh, like, she's awesome. I feel like her name's been popping up a lot because yeah. I, I talked to a couple of students at, at uh, UNC Gillings uh, MBA mm -hmm. program, and yeah, she's come she's come up quite quite often in the last few weeks. Yeah. So maybe I'll try try to get her on the podcast. As oh, well you should. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> would highly recommend. She's an expert in all things design thinking. Right, right, right. Okay, well, definitely. I, I will I look forward to that. And I, I just love how, like, all these connections are being made, yeah. uh, which, which is really, really cool. Yeah, um, me too. Yeah, and, and I know you're on the, well, when this episode is released, you will have, you would have, you would have been completed your MPH program and became, become a master of public health, I guess, <laughs> you have degree holder. Right. Um, so do, do you want to talk a little bit about, like, what you see for the future in, in your career, like, what what does like right now? How are you feeling? What what are, what are like the perceptions and, and thinking like that's going on right now in your head as you come into the end of your MPH program? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm feeling a lot of things. So I think something that's really important to remember as public health practitioners is that we're also humans and experience feelings like inside and outside of whatever we're doing, and so externally outside of MPH things, feeling a lot of emotions because I've built really great community here. And so 
definitely sad to be doing a lot of things for the last time. Um, within the MPH, thankfully, things are winding down. We had, in, instead of a thesis, our program does a culminating capstone experience, which is a year, year-long project. And mine was doing what's called an REM evaluation. So it's a participatory form of evaluating. And essentially what it does is kind of like human-centered design. Um, once you've evaluated, you map out the evaluation and ask participants to give feedback. So it's really cool because again, it centers um, voices in every aspect of it. So just finished that. So the biggest part of my MPH is done, thankfully, and have a few projects left to go. Um, and we'll be graduating in two weeks from now, which is really exciting. Um, and then I am looking forward to resting and recuperating the summer because I will be starting doctoral training um, in August. And so I guess that comes into what I see next is, well, we'll be in a PhD program for a while for the next four years. But after that, I really hope to do my own research um, again with human centered design, social innovation um, that is community based participatory research and also specifically capacity building and decolonizing, just again, to center community voices in ways that might not have been done in the past. And so I'm really I'm really excited for the future. I've been working really hard towards this and have been dreaming about it for a while. So it's really cool to know that um, I just have one more step left. Well, a few more, but one big one um, to get there. Yeah, well, kudos to you once again. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing like the progression of your story and like how you got to this point of wanting to pursue a PhD and like your takeaways of everything that you've gotten up to this point. And, and I, I, I'm guessing that we will take more into the human centered design as we talk more about your MPH a little bit later on. But before we get into any of your collegiate experiences, what does public health mean to you? Oh my gosh, great question. Well, first of all, thank you for all your kind words, but great question. I often tell people that the reason I love public health is because for the public, I mean, looking at the words, for the public to be healthy, that includes a lot of things. And so in my research, I want to address the many, many social determinants or factors that negatively impact communities of color. Um, in my own research, very interested in migrant experiences, Latin American experiences. But anyways, in thinking about public health, so the health of the public, that encompasses everything. It encompasses spiritual health, mental health, physical health. And then in those things, you have all the factors that might impact that. So for example, in spiritual health, do you have a faith community? If not, why don't you have it? Is it transportation that's keeping you from going to church? Is it that maybe you're the faith minority where you're living and then that can affect your mental health? And then in turn, we know that mental health things affect physical health. And so I just love that public health is so intertwined with people as a whole. Um, so what public health means to me, sorry, long winded way to answer your question. What public health means to me is looking at communities and individual as whole beings, mental, spiritual, physical, all the healths together, and understanding what factors might impact them from living a quality life, having quality health, and then being able to address those things, again, in partnership with communities, centering communities and their voices. Love it. And I think that speaks to like the intersectionality of public health and the challenges that people right. have in receiving the optimal quality of life and health. It's like, you know, you can think about the spiritual health, but it doesn't go without thinking about what are those barriers that are not anything related to spiritual health. They said like transportation or like if, if there even is that type of place that you practice your spirituality um, within your region and all these other intersectional ways that we have to think about public health and health in general. So, so I appreciate you sharing that. But you got your bachelor's in health education and behavior at the University of Florida. Go Gators once again. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a, a little bit about the thought process of going into undergrad. Yeah, well, go Gators, first of all, most importantly. Mm -hmm. um, but I, oh gosh, it's a long story. So I went into undergrad. I was the first in my family, like my new, uh, what's that called? my family, my nuclear family, um, and my extended family. I was the first to get a degree in the United States. 
And so it was very stressful. My little cousin is now about to be the last to get a university education here. And I remember talking to her and I was like, you have no idea. Like you have it so easy now because of me. Like we know our family knows now the processes and you get to live off of that. And I'm, I'm really glad she does. But all I have to say is it was really hard. And so I came in convinced I was going to be a physician. I was going to be pre-med. I was going to I don't know, be a surgeon. It was going to be great. I was going to make my immigrant family proud by like being a doctor, all those things. And I went to a high school that didn't offer AP courses. Um, and so I was not ready for college, uh, experience, difficult college classes, I would say. And so my first semester, I took biology and I got a C plus, which in retrospect, wasn't the worst thing to happen to me, right? But I remember sobbing, just being like, if I got a C in biology, how in the world am I ever going to do well in any of the harder courses required for med school? And so I learned about nurse practitioners. I decided I was switching my major to nursing and I loved all the classes. And in order to, at the University of Florida, I think most undergrad institutions, you do two years of the prereqs, and then you apply after the second year to the pro the nursing program itself. And so I did really well in all the prereqs. I remember applying and not getting in. And I remember going to my advisor and I was like, hey, can you like explain what went wrong? Like, what could I have done differently? And my advisor was like, no, I think that it was just like some people had better applications. Like your application wasn't bad, just some people were better. And I remember just feeling like that was a sign. Um, I something that's really important to me is my faith. And in that moment, I was like, okay, like, I'm just going to trust this is because there's something better than me for me. And so it's funny, because I did get into the health science major at UF. And I, again, had the whole I want to make my immigrant parents proud, like, I want to say I'm doing the hard thing. So I was like, you had to get into health science. So I'm going to do health science. And I remember looking at the classes and being like, this isn't fun. <laughs> and then I remember not feeling peace about it. I was so anxious. And I'd say I've really learned to follow my gut since that is something like a really pivotal moment in re that realization. And I remember just like kept thinking about health education, that major, kept thinking of the classes I'd be taking, kept thinking about the faculty I'd met in that department. So I was like, okay, like, I'm going to make this decision for myself, maybe not the major you get into, maybe not the coolest, hardest major at the University of Florida, although I think it is now, but, you know, um, and so I did, and I loved it. I remember my my friends being super stressed their last two years of undergrad, and I had a great time because I loved my classes. I took, for example, one called Adapting um, Programs for People with Disabilities, and we, like, got to practice things that we would do to make create more inclusive environments for people. Um, we also I remember taking an international health class that I loved, like it didn't feel like it was school, it felt like I was doing what I enjoyed. And then um, in our final semester, we had to do an internship. And I think things really clicked for me because it didn't feel like work, like it felt like something I would volunteer to do. And so yeah, that was kind of the very large roadmap to doing health education. And I remember looking for jobs right after undergrad. And I was so stressed because I, I didn't know what kind of jobs health educators had other than what I had learned in my classes. And I ended up in a position for pros Black and Latino men's prostate cancer disparities. So trying to reduce the disproportionate burden of prostate cancer. And I had applied to that job. It was the only job I got. So I was like, let's go for it. And at first I hated it. It was so uncomfortable. I, you know, first job out, my boss has become one of my greatest mentors. But at the time, I was like, I don't think she likes me. Like, I don't think this is a job for me. And again, I'm so grateful that door was open to me because that's led to where I am now. I still have the same principal investigator, but getting there made me realize how much I loved research. And so I've been in meetings with um, my principal investigator. Her name is Dr. Philip Kemiodena, one of the most incredible, impactful people I know. Um, and she's a Nigerian woman who really fights for African and Black American and Black Caribbean men to reduce their disproportionate 
burden of prostate cancer. And I've been in meetings with her where I've seen her tell someone like, you're not centering the community in this, and this is what you need to do differently. And so had I not switched to health education, had I not taken that job that at first I was really confused about, I wouldn't know my love for research or the kind of research that I want to be and really advocating for health equity and being willing to call people out when they're not advancing health equity or centering communities. And so it's been a long, weird road to get here, but I'm really grateful that I'm here and that I didn't get accepted in the nursing school, which at the beginning was the worst thing that could happen. But now I think it's one of the best things that have happened. It, it truly is funny how life works out that way to like those things and those moments are like, wow, like, like you're crying, you're in tears and like, I'm a failure. And then years later, you realize like that was just a part of my journey to get where I am. And that was a learning lesson. And I grew from those opportunities and those experiences. And I just want to kind of unpack a couple of the things that you said there. Firstly, uh, you are going to be a doctor. So your family can be very proud of that <laughs> sometime soon. I'm like, when they listen to this, because it will be after you, you graduate, definitely. I, I think this will be something to, to celebrate with, with them. Like just thinking about full circle, because I think many times we don't think of becoming like a, a doctoral doctor. We only think about physicians because that's what's like out in the in the limelight for most people. So yes, you're going to be a dope doctor, just, just so you know that. And then I also appreciate you sharing that you were the first person in your family to go to university here in, in the U.S. and what that meant for you, like just learning about that and or like not knowing about all the things that came about it. And now you're blazing that path and helping all your other cousins and siblings and everyone else to like just know what to expect and just know how to better navigate that. And that that is a big win um, in, in all of that. And there was one other thing I wanted to say that I cannot remember right now. But anyway, <laughs> so so in, in all of that, were there any like big undergrad takeaways that, that you wanted to share with people as as they're thinking about their careers and, and their progression? Yes, definitely. Thank you again for your kind words. It has been a journey to get here. And I agree. I think that a lot of people think physicians are the only ones who can help help the health of communities or like the only truly altruistic career choice. And I I'm so glad I found public health because I look back and I would not want to be a physician. In this moment, I would not want to be a physician. I love where I am and I love that what I want to do is just talk to people to understand what would help their situations and barriers. Um, especially I'm a very relational, extroverted person. And so I love, obviously there'll be some, you know, frustrating math involved, logistics, administrative things, but I love that at the end of the day, it's just talking to people and working alongside communities. So, but yes, in my undergraduate journey, I think one of the most beneficial thing, well, three things that I, I'm glad I did. And I wish I could have told myself to not be so anxious about is one, just to like, trust my gut and trust my emotions. Um, I think that a lot of times we get so in our head and so worried about doing the right thing to open the right door to meet the right like person that'll like advocate for us in the right situation. And I think we forget that we have everything it takes to be successful. And that worst case is never that worst case. Like for me, nursing school is worse. Not getting into nursing school is worst case scenario or failing getting the C in biology was my worst case scenario. And it ended up not being that bad. And so I think, and which is way easier said than done, I tend to get very anxious. So if someone told me that, I'd probably be very upset at them. But um, I do think it does help to remember that you have what it takes to succeed and you have what it takes to recover from setbacks. Um, and I'm very much a sit in your emotions and grieve loss kind of person. And I think that's important, but I also do think there's a moment where you need to believe in yourself and stand back up and get back to fighting because you can come back. So that's number one. Number two, one of the most beneficial things that I did that I wish I would have done sooner and tell everyone is to try things. So for example, I did a quality improvement internship at um, UF's neuro, UF Health's neuromedicine department. I didn't know anything about quality improvement. But I knew I didn't have work experience and I didn't really know what health educators did 
So I was like, let me try this out because when I graduate, I want to know what kind, at least what jobs I don't like. And I'm so glad I did because one, I, m- I made great friends. The, if the worst thing that happens is you meet friends or you make a mentor, it's not that bad. I gained a great mentor, Dr. Jacqueline Baron Lee, who wrote a letter of recommendation, has written numerous letters of recommendations for me. But in addition to that, I learned that maybe I like working in a hospital, but not in like a clinical role. Or I learned that I enjoy making infographics that are readable for people. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't taken on that um, internship. I also went to Haiti for three, three years, three different years with a really great sustainable development organization called P4H Global. And they're actually the ones who made me realize how much I love monitoring and evaluation, because how are you going to know if something's helping if you're not able to point back to the evaluation and say, they said they liked this. And so we kept doing it or they said they didn't like this. So we stopped doing it. I wouldn't have known that if I didn't go to Haiti with P4H. I wouldn't have known that sustainability is super important and that I want to be a decolonizing public health practitioner if it weren't for them. I wouldn't have gained incredible mentors, um, Dr. Bertrude Albert and Dr. Priscilla Zalea. Like to this day, are I always tell them you're the reason, like I would not have wanted to apply for a PhD if I hadn't have met them and seen women of color who were PhDs and then met Dr. Odenna who showed me the same. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is I would just have fun undergrad, you meet great people, you make community. And to the, I really thought my high school friends were going to be my best friends forever. So funny. Um, and I, st- I still have great friends from high school, but I would say some of the closest people to me are the friends that I made in college. And some of them are my network, like I want to work with them one day. And so just encouraging people that academics are important. I'll be the first to stress out about an exam and like I have a presentation on Wednesday and I was stressed about if it was good or not. And I'm graduating in a week. Like at the end of the day, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But anyways, all I have to say is academics are important, but there's other things in life that are important and public health is difficult. And so it's important to guard your mind, body and soul while also pursuing those academic endeavors. Very, very important. And I think that, that that kind of points to your point about like having some rest before you go into this doctoral program, because that, that is very important. Because I can only imagine the MPH program and the MPH program during COVID was was something that was uh, very, very difficult. And uh, I didn't remember what I was going to say earlier, like you going into schools such as like UF, such a big school, I think that in itself could have been like difficult and just understanding how to navigate that, especially in those first first year classes when it's like hundreds of students and things like that like it could be very difficult for someone that is not used to that kind of environment to kind of thrive there and I think you also mentioned something along the lines of like getting into the job after your your bachelor's and just having kind of like imposter syndrome of like hey is this what I'm supposed to be doing um but I, I think like in that as you said like that imposter syndrome those setbacks are just part of the growth journey and like how we are able to become who we're supposed to be. So yes, it is hard in that in those times, but like looking back on it, it definitely is something that that is very valuable. Uh, so I appreciate you sharing that. Yes, no, thank you. I, yes, it was very overwhelming. Kind of what I was going, were referring to and seeking opportunities too. I went into UF with one friend. I actually went to the University of Florida because of my best friend from high school. And then we stopped being friends my first semester and didn't know anybody. Um, And her and I were the only two people from our high school to this day who went to UF from undergrad. So it was very lonely. It was really, really hard for me. And especially coming from a collective culture that really values family, it was really hard to be too. My family was two hours away, but still really hard for me. I went home every weekend. (laughs) But when I went to Haiti um, with P4H Global, Those became like everyone I met on that trip either became my closest friends or introduced me to the people who are now my closest friends. And we went to we all went to or most of us went to the same church together. Most of us were connected in the same circles. And that was such a valuable part of undergrad, again, in molding my professional interests, but also in just helping me create community. And so 
very I'm very 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 grateful for them for so many reasons yeah shout, shout out to all those friends and and that community and I yeah. think, like it just speaks to us as humans and like us in growing into what we want to do and just learning more about ourselves then we find people that are like more aligned with us in doing that and like that's not as you said like we all still have some friends from high school or some friends from college but it's really the the, the people that have been able to build that community and like just align in so many ways and maybe are passionate about similar things that, that you're able to grow and uh re really just like have that relationship which is very important to health as, as we kind of shared a little bit earlier so talking about graduating from your bachelor's program you said you weren't sure what the health educator did and between your bachelor's and mph you had a, a couple of positions you, had, you were a community health educator and research coordinator at the university of florida which you started during your undergrad uh, as well as a biolog biological scientist three at the Florida Department of Health in Lee County, as well as a social media content creator at Greenhouse Church. So do you want to talk a little bit about those experiences and how, how they kind of lined up for you after graduating from your bachelor's program? Yeah, I my life has taken so many interesting turns. Again, like, want to be a doctor, not getting into nursing school, health science, health educator. Like, I've tried out a lot of things, which I think people are afraid to do but I'm so glad I did because I know what I like and I know what I don't like and now I can go into a career knowing this is what I want to do because I have experiences that have pointed to that but when I got so I graduated I became a health educator it's called the UF Care 2 Health Equity Center it's um an NCI U54 which basically means it's really cool, a translational research center to advance health equity. And so we had our community engagement core, which I was a part of. There was a research core and then um, the hard science core. And so essentially what I did is I was in charge in the evaluation core. And I was in charge of making sure that everything that happened research wise was communicated to the community. And again, I didn't love it at first. I was a little confused as to what my role was, all those things. And um, a few months in, I actually received a scholarship to attend a school of ministry program with the church that I was a part of in Gainesville. So I actually ended up quitting that job three months in, maybe. I felt so bad, but my boss was really supportive of, she's really, again, Dr. Dunna is super supportive of women advancing their careers, of learning more, of just gaining knowledge, whatever that looks like. So she was very kind about it, very supporting. And so um, went back to Gainesville to do school of ministry part time. And so I guess what that meant to me is as a person of faith, I feel very passionately about caring for people well. Um, and I realized that a lot of communities of faith haven't done that well and have used their faith as a reason to hate or exclude others. And so it's really important for me to fight that, I guess, um, and love people well, despite their background, beliefs, identity, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was really excited to do the School of Ministry, kind of learn more about what I believed and how I could translate what I believed into serving people well. Um, but it was part time, so I needed to find a job. And I ended up becoming a research coordinator at um, the UF College of Health and Human Performance in the uh, health education department, so the department I graduated with. And I really liked it. Um, essentially, our study was trying to reduce marijuana use in truant kids who were truant, and so essentially kids who missed a lot of school and ended up having to go to court um, for the amount of school they missed. And I really enjoyed it because there was a lot of, again, intersectionality into that of in the county we were looking at had really high poverty, a lot of parents who weren't absent. So it was like, OK, like, why are we missing so much school? You know, like, I don't think it's just you don't want to go. I think there's other factors associated with it. And that really showed me my desire to address social determinants of health. Um, but then the pandemic hit and a big part of my job was going to schools. And so schools shut down. And I couldn't go to schools anymore. And the school of ministry went online. So I had no reason to be in Gainesville other than I was living with a really kind family at the time. And I also felt uncomfortable being a burden to them. So moved to Orlando and I was like, I need a job. <laughs> and I 
also I'm just the kind of person that if I sit at home all day, like nobody wants that. I will annoy everyone in my life. You like, you don't want that for me. You also don't want that for you. So I heard that a lot of my friends in MPH programs were getting recruited by the Florida Department of Health to essentially be contact tracers. The term is like biological scientists, but it's really just contact tracer is what I was. And so I was deployed to, it is what they call it, to Lee County, um, which is, I was in Fort Myers, their Department of Health, and I was a contact tracer for them. And so it was really challenging. Um, I was the only Latin American contact tracer for a while, despite the majority of our cases being Latin American. Um, one call that I distinctly remember is I call, oh, there's a big farm worker community in Lee County, um, Amakali, Florida is, predom- is predominantly farm workers who, again, intersectionality experience a lot of different factors, um, low pay, injustices in housing, not good transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And so I remember this call with this man and I, I told him, hey, like you have COVID. This means you have to quarantine for 14 days. At the time, the recommendations where you had to quarantine until you were a certain amount of time um, symptom free. And so I, I was like, I know this is unfortunate with work. Is there anyone I can send um, a letter to? And he like uh, your boss or something saying that the Department of Health says you can't work. And he was like, yes, can I get an email or phone number? And I keep, I kept spelling out the email and he kept asking me to repeat myself. And I remember getting annoyed, which I hate that I did now, but I got annoyed and I kept saying it. And then he sighed and he was like, I'm sorry. I just, I don't know how to read or write. So I'm trying to do this in a way that I'll remember. And I just remember that really hitting me and feeling so much frustration that one, the infrastructure at that moment wasn't there to support him. Um, Like he needed to have this phone number to get this letter. And I realized that there were just so many intersectionalities to what was happening that Latin American communities had the most, like were the most cases. And I was like, why? But it was because the reality is a lot of migrant farm workers experience injustice. And so a lot of the people over them didn't care that there was COVID. What they cared about was getting food on the table, which a side note, we don't appreciate farm workers enough, but that was something really challenging for me and really frustrating. And in that moment, I was like, I have to be someone that does something about this. And so since I graduated, I considered higher education, but I think that was one of those moments where I was like, in the position I'm in in this moment, I can't do anything other than help this person, but who's going to help the next person? Because it was a temporary position. I, I wasn't going to be there for long term. And so that was really hard. It was really challenging again. And then I, I ended up getting COVID. <laughs> While I was working there and I remember looking for a rapid test and at the time in Lee County rapid tests were $150 and the ones that were free were took three to four days and I wasn't mad for myself I like the Department of Health was paying for a hotel room and um, I had the means to quarantine and feed myself but I felt really frustrated for those like my farm workers that had COVID they needed to work. They needed to put food on the table. They needed income more than those who could afford a $150 test, right? But they, there was no way that they would be able to do those things. And so, again, that just really solidified what I wanted to do. And it was a temporary job. So eventually I was like, okay, I think it's time to go home, look for another job. I'm also not an epidemiologist. So I was like, I probably someone else should be in this role for me. Um, although I hope that doesn't get me in trouble. I was just doing basic contact tracing things. Um, and so I ended up reaching back out to the first job I had with care Two, And again, one of those things full circle that I remember when I quit, I was like, dang, like, why did I apply to this job? I shouldn't have done it in the first place, but got the job again, the job that I had initially quit. And was again working as a health educator doing the same thing. And then I remember one day getting an email from my boss 
And she was like, we got the SEAL grant. We're so excited. Jessica, you're in charge of this one, okay? And I was like, what SEAL grant? Like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> so I come into work or eventually, I think we were hybrid. And I try to familiar my, familiarize myself with this grant. And it's called the NIH Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities. Long thing. But basically, SEAL. And my job became understanding how to reduce the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 in communities of color. And that was hard because at the time I was confused, right? Like I had the same questions, but what I really loved about that job and what really made me fall fall in love with community-based research was that one of our catchment areas, so the the location we were trying to uh, work with, um, was Osceola County, which is the county that I grew up in, where all my friends were. And we were working with predominantly Black and Latino communities. So my community and the community of a lot of my friends. And it felt like I was just talking to my friends of like, hey, what are you hearing? Who's saying what? Like, who, who, what would it take for you to trust like accurate information? And I realized it's not that hard to center communities. Like, you just have to talk with people, right? And so I was like, okay, I want to do this the rest of my life. Like if I could go back to Lee County further down, like I'd love to be someone that talks to farm workers and asks, what do you need? And then advocate for them to receive that. And hopefully, you know, be in a position where people listen to me. But um, SEAL is one of the most unexpected, but honestly, great things that have happened to me because it really, which COVID is terrible, which that wouldn't have happened and SEAL wouldn't be here without COVID. So I do want to preface that, like would rather there no be, co- be no COVID, no SEAL. But being in that position has been a huge blessing in that it's really solidified my desire to work with communities. And it's really shown how much mistrust there is, um, rightfully so because of injustices of the past. So I remember we had a focus group and we were trying to understand, again, just attitudes and perspectives towards COVID and who people might listen to, all those things. And I remember someone saying, okay, there's a bunch of public health people coming in now, but they never cared about our community until COVID happened. Like they're here now because they got the grants, they need the numbers, they need the information so they can say they did something. And that really hit me because it's true. Like there were so many people suddenly interested in communities of color because communities of color were the ones who needed the help and something that was really highlighted. And I remember being on a panel and one of the panelists saying like all these disparities brought out in COVID, they're not new, they're just highlighted. Um, And so that really solidified, again, my dedication to advancing health equity through research, because I really do believe in research and public health capacity to advance um, health equity. I really believe in its ability to fight systems and structures that are set against people of color. And I don't think people have taken advantage of that. I don't think people have centered communities or even treated them justly within public health. And so I am really excited to hopefully, you know, be, be a researcher that does that well and kind of shifts the narrative because I'd love for, I don't know, 40 years down the line, a community member, rather than saying you never cared about me, being like, oh, I know Dr. Otero Machuco one day, hopefully, you know, they can call me Jess. I know Jess cares about me. I know that she's advocating for me. You know, like I want to know people are saying that. And I want to know that there's like, I, I hope that people would say, I know that research is helping because it's proving and showing the numbers and sharing my story in ways that is being translated into solutions. And so again, really long, weird, unexpected things that have gotten me to this point. And then a lot of them, I was like, why am I here? What am I doing? But I, in this moment, like I truly am grateful for all the things that have brought me to this moment. Yeah, well, I appreciate you sharing those stories. I think they really highlight like the importance of this work and like the the farm worker story. Just understanding like the work that we're doing is like a band aid as opposed to solving the root causes or like create creating systems and policies and practices and structures that actually support these communities that need them. And like to to your point, 
Uh, it definitely was highlighted and it also highlighted the fact that we as public health and we as people trying to improve health didn't have those connections to the people who are community leaders to to say, hey, this is the information that we know, this is how we're going to pass it on, or like, what do you need? And how can we create those systems and those feedback loops to give you what you need and to advocate for those changes? And yes, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to realize like there's power in censoring community and like how it's not difficult. It's just something that we just have to be intentional about in public health and in all these other health saving um, fields because because it is it is very very important so so thank you for sharing all of that um and and just like prefacing like before before everything you said like just doing more you said that you you wanted to learn what you liked wanted to learn what you didn't like and i think that is like hugely hugely important for everyone especially in public health since there's so many ways that you can like work in public health and practice public health it's important for you to like understand okay do i like this type of epidemiology work or do I want to do more health education work or do I want to advocate for this community or like just or even like figuring out what types of communities you want to work with I, I think is, is very very important one other thing that you shared there was that you had MPH friends so like when when did did when did kind of public health come into like your realm of understanding was this as a health educator was this like from MPH friends or like tell, tell me more about that yeah, great question. I'd say kind of in every aspect, something about me, I talk too much. <laughs> um, and so, but it's worked in my favor because I just talk to people and make great friends. And so and you, talk, you talk just enough then. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I'll use that one from now. But um, in undergrad, I made really, really great friends, both within my classes and outside of them. Um, but it was really fun to be in a class and be like, oh, hey, I know you and start talking and kind of developing those friendships more. So, for example, I am moving to D.C. to start my Ph.D. at GW in August. And there's a girl who was one of my classes that I was friends with who lives there now um, as a, and she's a nurse. And so I was like, great, I have a friend already. Um, but anyways. That's something that I was always tried to do is just be intentional with those around me, whether it's in classes, church, other circles. Um, and so through my bachelor's, I did meet a lot of people who coincidentally, honestly, just cared about the same things. Um, and so one of my closest friends, for example, she is working at Moffitt Cancer Center as an epidemiologist. She also got her MPH in epidemiology at the University of Florida, and she, she's just killing it. She is an editor for a magazine. She writes um, different things on infectious disease. She's been on a lot of podcasts, super proud of her. But I don't think what brought us together was public health. I think what brought us together was just we cared about people and we cared about each other. And then we found we had a lot of the same passions. Um, but then um, through working, a lot of my coworkers have become really great friends. And in my MPH, um, I've also made really great friends who I know are just going to do incredible things. So I'd say it was a little bit of both being intentional with people that I met that were in the field that I met once being in the field, but also just making friends through different programs, work opportunities. And I find that it's really helpful to talk about what you're interested in and what you want to do, because you, you'll you be surprised how many people care about the same things and might inspire you or might learn from what you're doing. Very, very important. Just being open-minded to meeting people and creating those relationships. Because like to that point, we never know where someone's going to be or like what, like, like to your story path. It's like, you know, there's so many different, paths that you took to get where you are and other people are doing that that exact same thing in their life and you don't know where that intersection is going to come later on in life or where that geographic intersection is going to come where, where you have friends so yeah that that's awesome and i, I advocate that for everyone because i think there's also a huge part of like that peer learning part of things like there's so much that you can learn from your peers because as, as I said once again like public health and like the health saving field is just so so big there's so much to, to, to learn in that um so so yeah okay so you did you you were you are an associate clinical research coordinator at the Mayo Clinic and that yes. started that started before your MPH correct mm -hmm. okay yes. so tell me about tell me about the process of of starting up there 
yeah so again just one of those life happen and I went with it things of my um principal investigator slash incredible mentor Dr. Odedna um I was working with her at the University of Florida's Care 2 Health Equity Center um where she was a principal investigator and she ended up um going to Mayo and so she asked if I wanted to go with her. And I was like, absolutely. And so I, you know, applied, interviewed, did the whole thing. um, And then started working with her team at Mayo Clinic um, and continued in my role. So essentially doing the same things with SEAL. She took a lot of her grants with her. And so I continued coordinating efforts for the SEAL grant and a lot of, it included a lot of things. And so a lot of it was going to community outreach events, something that I found worked really well was I'd go to a lot of um, food pantry events. And so because community members go there, I I found that a lot of communities would go every Saturday. And so something that I'm really passionate about is meeting people where they are instead of expecting them to suddenly want to go to you and listen to you. You know, a little irrational, but you know. And so we'd go to these community events most Saturdays and we'd talk about COVID and we'd talk about COVID-19 vaccines And we found that people really trusted us. So, for example, there was a woman who was undocumented. And I remember her being like, yeah, I'm kind of scared to get my vaccine because I'm scared they'll deport me. And I was like, yeah, super fair, super valid. Um, But also happy to share that's not something that'll happen. Like, as a matter of fact, they've said you can't do that. You can't check identity identification, at least at the time. I'm not sure what the laws are now. And so... Um, It just became really great ways to talk to people. And then as, you know, COVID progressed, environments and perspectives and attitudes towards COVID shifted. Um, I still continue to do COVID-19 education, mostly online now, um, and work on a few other grants centered around reducing um, cancer, disproportionate burdens of cancer in mostly Black and African men. Um, And so I really love it. I really love working with Dr. Adenna. I really enjoy working with my team. I found that they all really inspire me. And uh, yeah, I'm really blessed to be in that position. Yeah, that is a blessing. It's always cool to like kind of get like recruited in, into a position or like move with someone that you like love right. or trust, work well with. So, so shout out to that. And shout yeah. out to like that, that opportunity to, to really just like unfold for you. And you are a current Master of Public Health student in the Equity, Social Justice, and Human Rights at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Mm-hmm. When people are listening to this, you probably already have graduated. So once again, congratulations. Shouts out to you. Um, but t- tell us, what, what what was that thought process of thinking about getting an MPH? And yeah, share, share more about that. Yeah. So the more that I worked with Dr. Adenna, the more I'd be like, I want to be like you. And so there was a few doctoral programs that didn't require a master's degree that I applied for, but I was also like, hmm, let's be realistic. I don't think that's going to work. And so I was like, okay, like I need tools and skills from an MPH in order to be an effective researcher. And I honestly was not very skilled or knowledgeable about a lot of research things such as I don't know data coding and things like that so I was like this is something I need I need to learn more if I want to ever be a researcher and so I decided to apply for masters of public health programs and I applied to a few very blessed again to get into a few different programs and at first there was actually one that I wanted to go to more than um, UNC's but um, I so something I'd advise to anyone who's pursuing honestly any higher, higher education is to reach out to the faculty with similar interests in those programs and ask for what opportunities exist, both to work with them, but also to gain funding because graduate education is expensive. And so at UNC, um, more people answered than at any of the other schools that I was accepted into. And one of my really, really great mentors here that I've found was really willing to advocate for me and help me find funding. And so um, that's how I ended up at UNC is I something that, again, going with my gut, but also just following open doors and trusting that they're being open for a reason. And so 
I followed the open doors, came to UNC, and it was a little challenging at first the transition into a, a new program, into a new city. It was my first time moving out of Florida, which was actually really hard for me. And again, had built really great community in undergrad. And so it was an adjustment. But now I guess being at the end and looking back, I'm so grateful that I did. I have gained really, really valuable mentors, really valuable work experiences through my MPH, um, and really great friends who, again, I know are going to change the world with their also MPH degrees from different concentrations. And so um, I'm glad that I came here, even though there were moments where I was really stressed and I was like, mm, should I be here? I don't know. And so my degree is a little unique in that um, it's one of the only MPH health equity concentrations in the country. I think Boston University is the only other one who has one. And so a lot of our courses were centered around understanding different health equity issues. So health disparities um, and kind of the roots to them. So learning a lot about the systems and structures as to why a lot of health equity issues exist. Um, and that could be challenging because it's really hard to look like even just as a person of color, like learning how other people of color are affected by things. And so I'm definitely glad to have built community that both helped me process that, but also find joy in, in other things and what we were doing. Um, but even beyond the coursework, one of the most valuable things for me is just how many people were willing to work with me. So again, like I'm a design thinking fellow at Innovate Carolina, and that's because um, Dr. Liz Chen, you know, after interviewing and things offered me that position. Um, and I've been able to learn so much from her or um, I have an assistantship and because people were willing to work with me and were able to find me resources. And so that's been a huge blessing is the mentorship and experiences that I've gained, both in community based research, human to center design and other things that I've really even publications. Oh, my gosh. One of my incredible mentors, his name is Brian, Dr. Brian Southwell. Um I, I had told him at the beginning of my MPH, I really want to apply to PhD programs after this. What do I need to do? And he was like, well, you need publications. I think that would be helpful for you. Um, and I was like, <laughs> I should be like, how am I going to, like mentally, I was like, how am I going to do that? Like, how do you find people to publish with? And then just a week later, he emailed me and was like, hey, I, I got approached to publish in this journal. Do you want to be a co-author with me? And so that has been one of the greatest blessings of my MPH has been having people that are so willing to collaborate with me, but also mentor me and both speak truth, but also encourage me in what I could do better. And so that's another thing that I definitely recommend in any aspect of your educational journey, whether it's undergrad, grad school, um, I don't know, early stage is finding people that are willing to mentor you. Um, because in my experience, and I, I know that's not everyone's experiences, in every place that I've been, there's been people who are willing to advocate for me and mentor me, but I would not have grown that relationship if I hadn't put the work in or maybe taken the initiative to reach out to them. And so sometimes it can be uncomfortable. Sometimes I get social anxiety in like those situations, but it's so worth it to do it. Yeah. Leaning into that uncomfortability also equals growth a lot of the times not, right. not always but mo most yeah. of the times and uh, I, I love your thought process of like i want to be a researcher and, and do research and like this public health theme but i don't really know the tools or how to effectively do that so let me get my mph so that i'm able to equip myself to better understand and implement these tools into the work that i'm doing and then i i also love that you were you you like figured out okay let me let me reach out to professors here and in that i think that that is huge like if you don't get responses from from people then you know it, it can be very tough for you especially as you're someone right. that you said like moving out of florida to go to to north carolina that's a, a big leap for some people and i'd imagine for yourself so just realizing that like there are people here that are trying to support you and like not even being in the program but they're they're willing to talk to you and help you and then like to your point it's like okay i'm thinking about getting a phd what should i do and then they, the professor say you know you should get publications i'll make you a stronger uh, candidate in in becoming a, a, a doctoral student which i think is is awesome and like yes people reach out to, to professors before you go to mph programs really see if there are people there that are willing to support you and like use some of their time and resources to help you navigate your path um 
Yeah, so so I really appreciate that. So before I ask you about um, design thinking, the design thinking fellowship you had with Innovate Carolina, so you said it was difficult for you as you moved out to Florida to go to, go to Chapel Hill and uh, North Carolina to do your MPH. What are the types of things that you did to really like make that transition less hard for yourself? Yes, great question. So I, again, tend to get pretty anxious. And when I get anxious, I try to micromanage and control situations, which is not healthy for me. <laughs> but it did work out. So I wouldn't advise controlling situations or trying to make everything perfect because inevitably nothing is going to ever work out perfectly. But um, I, there was a group chat formed for everyone who got accepted into the Master of Public Health program. And so I asked a few questions just to understand maybe who had similar interests, things like that to me. And I ended up finding two, well, I've ended up finding someone who I was like, oh, I think it'd be fun to live together. And again, the social anxiety awkwardness I really pressed into was like, hey, um, I don't know if this is weird. I know we just met, but do you want to live together? And she said yes. And I'm so glad she did. And someone ended up approaching her kind of similarly with similar interests and asking her if she wanted to live with them. And she said yes. And so the three of us lived together. And I'm really glad that I connected with them before coming because we started to kind of develop a friendship, didn't really know each other, but we would text. I asked them, I don't know, what makes, what brings you joy? How do you feel loved? Basic questions like that. Um, and the three of us were all moving from new states at the time. And so it was helpful to find people that were in a similar position as me. And they've become my, some of my closest friends which I feel like I keep saying that on this call, but um, they have been such a blessing. And I know that's not always feasible for people to find friends before coming in, but what I'd recommend to anyone is finding community and finding people that bring you joy and are a great distraction. They happen to be doing MPH is one of them. She's doing it in environmental engineering. I've learned so much from her also, just someone who's doing something different than I am. Um, and then another one, she's in the health equity program with me as well. And it's been such a joy to live with them, not even because we're all in an MPH program, but because we've all learned how to have healthy relationships together and care for each other well, but also have fun. Um, like we do so many weird, random things where my stomach hurts from laughing, but I just love that. I love having community that makes me feel loved, but also makes me feel joy. And so that's something that's definitely been important for me and I hope to have in every season of my life is whether it's a few people, a lot of people, people that I feel known by and seen by and I can feel myself with. And so somewhere else that's been helpful in finding that has for me just been um, faith institutions and finding people who want to be community and want to support me, um, both just in life and in faith. But then also I joined a van random volleyball group. You know, I think that moving to a new place is really difficult and again, leaning into the uncomfortability, but I tried to find where people were that maybe had the same interests in me and try to go those places. And don't get me wrong, I had so many awkward encounters. There was one person that I met <laughs> at a church and I was like, we are going to be friends. And I tried so hard to be friends and it did not work out. <laughs> Nothing bad happened. It was just awkward, you know? So knowing when to let go, for sure, but definitely being intentional and seeking out friendships and people. Love that, love that. And yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. And I think that that's like a, a good note to any MPH program or like, I guess any kind of program out there, like create spaces for people to meet and to create those connections before they get onto campus or started in classes, because yeah, it's, it's so important to have those relationships and like to have people that you can, as you said, like find joy and share and laughter and, and build relationships as well as like get that um that peer leading, that that unstructured peer leading, which I think is, is hugely important as well. Uh, so so I appreciate you sharing that and I'm glad that you were able to make those connections, even though the person at church didn't didn't <laughs> want to or didn't work out as a great friend. You were right. able to find other great friends and, and that that's all part of the process, right? Right, yes. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so as you as you come to the end of your MPH program, are there any like takeaways or tips that you would give to someone as they're approaching or in an MPH program? Oh, definitely. I mean, the biggest one is again reach out to people 
before coming in, figuring out who has shared interests. Are they willing to work with people? Are they willing to mentor students? Do you get a good vibe from the school? You know, like all those things are important. Um, And then once in the MPH program, have boundaries for sure, but also seek out opportunities. And if you have the capacity to take something on, don't be afraid to say yes. Um, I have had so many random different experiences because I said yes, even though I felt imposter syndrome through them and wasn't sure if I was the most qualified, but they've, you know, helped me advance professionally and learn so much. And then also don't be afraid to develop mentorship um, relationships because I was really surprised, honestly, by the amount of people who were willing to help me. For example, in PhD applications, I think there was like seven or eight people that were willing to read my um, personal statement, which it was honestly too many people for me because I didn't have time to keep incorporating that feedback. But, you know, what a blessing it is to have that many people willing to help you out. And I wouldn't have had that if I hadn't have reached out and initiated those relationships. And then on a personal note, to care and guard your mind, body, and soul. Because I think a lot of people who come into an MPH have a desire to serve others. They have a desire to change systems and structures. They have a desire at least to see people experience good public health, right? But how are you going to pour out if your cup is empty? And so I think I also recommend before the academia, before the mentors, before the grades, before anything, like make sure you know what makes you feel full, what brings you joy and set out time intentionally um, to practice those things. Love that. Especially in this kind of public health work, that can be very daunting, especially for people of color that are in it. Um, So yeah, yeah, it is important to not be martyrs to the causes, but to also find joy in life while trying to move forward issues and shift systems and change policies and advocate for people who don't have a voice. So I appreciate you sharing that. Of course. Um, Yeah. And in that too, like, Something someone told me in undergrad that I have never forgotten is just, I don't, it's, it is a little violent of language, but like, know the hills you're willing to die on, because you don't have to die on every hill. And dying on every hill will drain your mental health and your capacity to fight the next battle, you know? So knowing the battles you're willing, because we all have different battles, like, in health, there's so many health equity issues, right? I can't possibly address all of them. But I know the ones I feel like I'm called to address. And yours might be different. Someone else's might be different. And across the board, we can all cover such different things, probably better than if one person tried to just dabble in a lot of like different ones because they feel like they need to. So knowing the hills that you want to die on, knowing the things you want to work in, if there's a health equity issue everyone's interested in, but you're not, that's okay because probably someone needs to be doing the work you're doing, you know? And so that's something that I've definitely learned the hard way, unfortunately, but I'm glad I learned. Yeah, yeah. No need to stretch yourself too thin. There are enough quote unquote issues or opportunities out there that we all need to work to, to find and fix. So like don't stress yourself out if it, it doesn't necessarily need you to stress yourself out. There are other people that are willing to fight that battle. You don't have to fight every battle uh, right. out there. So yes, yes, awesome. Okay, so you said going into your MPH program, you wanted you wanted to get a doctoral degree. During your MPH program, was there any, well, you are going to get a doctoral or you're, 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 you're in the process of going to GW to get a doctoral degree. First of all, is that a public health doctoral degree? Mm-hmm. So um, the the terminology phrasing of the degree, it's social and behavioral sciences. I don't think there's any public health PhDs. I know there's doctor PhDs. Um, they all kind of span social and behavioral sciences or like social behavioral interventions, that kind of thing. Right. So yeah, very, very much the public health. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So during your MPH, was there any change or like was there any like doubt in your mind that maybe I didn't want to pursue a PhD or like what was the thought process in confirming that I want to get this PhD and, and continue on in, in a doctoral degree program? Yeah. Um, no, I th- I'd say from the beginning till the end, I was very sure I wanted to be a researcher. I think part of it was having both really great people in my life, not just at, at UNC, 
but having really great mentors that showed me the kind of researcher I wanted to be and hearing stories about people that maybe weren't the kind of researcher I want to be kind of being like, okay, there's the good and the bad. And I want to contribute to the good and kind of in every class I learned, like I would often think about, oh, this would be cool to incorporate in research. For example, in design thinking, like completely changed my personal statement, what I thought my research would look like. And in being a design thinking fellow, I often think of like, okay, I need to remember this for when I'm doing my own research. Um, So thankfully, I came in very sure, left very sure. I won't lie to you. Did I think about taking a break? Absolutely. At this, ask me in two months how I feel, and I'm sure I'll be ready after my two month break. In this moment, I'm like, should I have taken a break? I don't know. (laughs) But outside of that, I have felt very sure that I want to pursue doctoral training and thankfully had the support um, to help me develop the skills that I felt was were missing both in my MPH and different outside opportunities. Um, But I know people who want to get their doctoral training and they're waiting a few years or people who want to work um, as public health practitioners with their MPH. And I don't think there's, I think that if I weren't going straight into doctoral training, I think I'd do great and I think I'd really enjoy it. And so I don't think there's one good or standard way for public health practitioners to go. I think it's just knowing what you want to do and what you need to do that and pursuing those things. Yeah, finding what's right for yourself yeah. is, is, is what's important there. And I think I forgot to ask you about the Design Thinking Fellowship at Innovate Carolina. We, yeah. So before we brush over that, like, that, are there any, like, what, what is a Design Thinking Fellowship? And, like, what, what are, like, key takeaways that you've gotten from this fellowship? Yeah, so Innovate Carolina offers different services um, to those who want to seek out their help. And one of them is design thinking services. And so it's a lot of different things. One is offering courses or like uh, teaching opportunities on human centered design and what it means, how people can incorporate into their work. But another part of that is working with clients um, to use human centered design to approach the issues or barriers that they're experiencing. And so one project, for example, that we're working on is um, the chancellor at the University of North Carolina has his strategic initiatives. And so we are working really closely with the chancellor's team to identify how we can progress and advance those strategic initiatives. And so it's looked like working with a lot of faculty across the university to understand what those initiatives mean to them, what they think we should test. A big part of design thinking is prototyping. And so doing very low input tests to under, to see if a product will or won't work in order to then put more input and scale it up. And so um, what I really enjoy about the fellowship is that it's allowed me to see design thinking across the course of design thinking. So from having an idea to figuring out how, how do we figure out what this idea even is to ideating position, potential solutions or understanding the resources that exist to then we'll be moving soon into the prototyping to see what might work um, in order to solve the problem or the barrier. And so it's been really great. I've really enjoyed, I I have realized about myself, I'm a very experiential learner. I learn the most while doing things or while watching others do things. And so it's been really helpful for me in that and also really helpful in just being able to receive mentorship um, from Liz in design thinking and what that looks like and how to lead design thinking teams um, like I would like to do one day. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm glad I didn't forget that. Uh, yeah. I'm glad that you will to share a little bit more about that. Um, so before we get into the Furious Five, the, the last section of the show, and I think you alluded to like where you'd like to see yourself in the future. And like I want to combine that with also you you shared a little bit about like having a perspective of like community focus, anti-colonial, and like decolonizing public health. Do you want to share just a little bit more about that and like where you'd like to see yourself in the future with with that as like the, I guess, the centerpiece of, of, of what you're thinking? Yeah, I love that question. So um, again, with going to P, to Haiti with P4H Global, um, I a friend of mine was leading the trip and she invited me, or she encouraged me to apply and go. Um, and so I go to Haiti and I didn't really understand what decolonized work looked like. I didn't understand what sustainability was. And 
which I'm ashamed to say, honestly, but give me some grace because I was a freshman in college. So in Haiti, we learned a lot about the harm that a lot of well-intentioned people had done. For example, um, which the Clinton administration took responsibility for this, but in the Clinton administration, a lot of rice was shipped to Haiti. And now the rice industry is not the same as it was because of that. Again, good intentions, but not executed correctly. And I remember learning that and just being like, man, like how many people do things trying to do good or trying to help a community? Granted, sometimes for selfish reasons, you know, wanting to feel good about it. But how many people do these quote unquote good things doing more harm than they do good? And so that really put me in the thought process of wanting to do things that would work with communities rather than quote unquote for communities or I don't know against communities right like working with communities to find the solutions to the barriers or problems they're facing and so that's why I loved when I found human-centered design because that's literally what it is is working hand in hand with the people experiencing whatever is being addressed but I always had that thought, wasn't sure what it looked like, learned a lot from P4H about evaluating programs, making sure that what you're doing is effective, working in partnership, doing things that are sustainable that won't do harm in the long run, even if it might be good in the short term. Um, And then I remember last semester, actually, I took a course, um, my professor name is Dr. Anshali Pumquist, incredible, incredible person, and who I learned so much from both inside, outside the classroom, but it was a decolonizing methodologies class. And I really liked receiving practical tools to decolonize research. And so essentially what I mean by that is not coming in with my assumptions, my ideas, my beliefs, and forcing a community to live within those, or even designing a study or designing a plan out of my assumptions, but rather positioning myself, understanding how maybe the way I think, the way I act, the way I believe might impact a community and center their beliefs and what they think um, and highlighting that slash letting them thrive in their beliefs, even if you know they might be different than mine. And so I really enjoyed that class and it made me realize that there are ways to actively practice sustainable anti-colonial work. And something that I'm really excited about is In my doctoral training, I'll be working a lot with um, Dr. Carlos Rodriguez Diaz at George Washington University in the Milken School of Public Health, who is the director of a newly opened center for community health um, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And what I love about the center is that their foundation is capacity building and anti-colonial community-based work. And so I, again, didn't know what human-centered design was, took a course in it, didn't really know what decolonizing research was, took a course in it and loved it. And I'm so glad I did. And these two things have become a really big part of the work I want to do. And there's a researcher at NC State. Her name is Dr. Leslie Ann Noel, also from Trinidad and Tobago, actually. Um, Really incredible woman who practices anti-colonial human-centered design work. And so what that means, we had a call a few weeks ago And she explained what that means. And it basically means highlighting people's voices that aren't normally highlighted. A lot of, you know, historically, a lot of the voices centered in research haven't been people of color. Um, That's why we're underrepresented, right, in the sciences. And so for me, practicing decolonized work means highlighting the voices of those who have been historically underrepresented in public health telling their stories the way they want it to be shared, not the way I think it should be shared or the way others think it should be shared and making sure that my beliefs, biases, um, ways I view the world, all those things that that doesn't get in the way of making sure that they're heard, seen and advocated for within public health. Love it. Love it, love it. And I think like that is the approach that all of us should be taking in public health. Like it just like is intentional in centering the community, ensuring like this is what they want, ensuring that their voice is at the table, ensuring that they are uh, they have the space to push back and say, No, this is not really like where where we see you fit. And like to your point, like working alongside them to to build to build whatever it is they see um needed in their communities. And like to that point, 
uh, a lot of the issues that we do see is because those communities have not been given a chance to be at the table and to share like their input or their solutions. So I look forward to seeing how how your work, your research, and everything like goes on and your practice to to really push this work forward because I think it is very very important. So once again, congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. So moving on to the Furious Five, the five questions I'm going to ask all guests. So number one. What advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? The biggest advice I'd give to students trying to pursue a career in public health is to try out different things. Public health is so broad. For example, I think I mentioned earlier, I have a friend who is an infectious disease specialist, director or something at Moffitt Cancer Center. So she's an epidemiologist and she does a great job, but I could never do what she does and I don't want to do what she does. You know, like she's great at it. I would not. Um, I have my roommate, she's an environmental engineer. I don't know what, how to do wastewater management. I don't think I want to know. That's not my interest, but she does because she fell into things that like made her realize that's what she liked. And so definitely seeking out different opportunities and trying out different things because public health is so big and there's room for everyone. Um, and so knowing exactly what you like and what will make you feel fulfilled in your position because public health is hard and there will be moments where it's really challenging and it would stink to be doing something you're not you don't like at the same time facing all these challenges um seek mentors i can't emphasize or stress that enough find the people who are willing to advocate for you find the people who are willing to seek out opportunities for you find the people who will call out unprofessionalism or maybe things that you could do better because it's uncomfortable, but it, it'll help. It'll, you'd rather hear it in love from someone who cares about you and advocates for you than someone who is me. <laughs> and then um, another thing that I definitely say is don't be afraid to seek out things. Don't be afraid to say yes to things. Imposter syndrome is super real. And the reality is these systems weren't created with us in mind but you have everything it takes to succeed within these systems. And there are people who have come before you and advocated for you. And there are people who are come behind you and will be so grateful that you were there. And it is really hard to be a glass ceilings breaker. It is really hard to be alone as a person of color or as an underrepresented um, person in the sciences. And that's super valid and that's super real. And you need to protect your mind against those things, but also remembering that imposter syndrome is real and it's a lie. Um, and speak truth over yourself that you deserve to be in these positions and have what it takes and find people that will remind you the truth when you don't believe it for yourself. So those are definitely the biggest things that I would say. Great, great advice. Um, number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Wow. I think kind of the same. Um, seek out mentors, seek out community, seek out people that when things are tough, I, I had to take the GRE and I was miserable. I hate, it was awful four months of my life. It was so stressful. And there's a lot of times where I was almost like, okay, I'm just not going to do this anymore. And the people in my life were like, no, you can do it. Like they knew, they knew my giving up was coming out of fear and not out of this is actually what I want to do. And they spoke truth in me and kept me going. Um, don't be afraid to knock on doors. I wouldn't have come to UNC if I hadn't asked for an assistantship and that door hadn't been open to me. I wouldn't have realized I liked research had I not gone to Haiti. Um, I wouldn't have realized the need for sustainable development had I not gone to Haiti. You know, all those things. And so don't be afraid to seek out opportunities, um, knock on doors, and don't be ashamed of disappointment or closed doors. That's not a reflection on you. Um, and it's fair to grieve. It's fair to sit in it and feel the disappointment. But it's also important to realize that a closed door is so cheesy. But a closed door doesn't mean it's the end. A closed door just means you have to find another one and there will be another one. Um, so not being afraid to don't don't forget that a setback is not the end absolutely absolutely uh, number three what's something you're working on improving in your life right now 
Oh my gosh, great question. Um, I think it's a blessing and a curse to be as self-aware as I am. So <laughs> many things, many things. I think that something I'm working on both personally and professionally is just being more present in my life. Um, and so what that means is I tend to be very future minded. I, again, tend to be very anxious to think too much about the future and can miss a lot of the present. So what am I learning in the present? How am I growing in the present? Um, even if something is difficult, what, what, what does it have to show me? You know? Um, and then I think I'm also, I'm a very big picture learner. I love big picture. I love thinking of big ideas. And unfortunately, that means I'm not great at little detailed things. And so very much working on that. My, my, my parents and my, si and my sister are so great at being detail oriented and at doing little like tedious things well. And I'm trying to learn from them. I really am. And so I, I'd say those two things are definitely the biggest ones. Love it. And I think self, self awareness is like a huge, 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 like a uh, superpower that a lot of us don't, don't understand <laughs> it, like how, how beneficial it could be. Uh, so this, I appreciate you sharing that being transparent. Um, number, number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Again, don't be afraid to talk to people. Um, I went to a few conferences this year for the first time. I'd also recommend that. For all of the above, seek out professional development opportunities, seek out conference opportunities, seek out publication opportunities. In a lot of research jobs, there's an the option to do that, even if you don't know about it. So don't be afraid to ask. Again, kind of going back to knocking down doors. Don't be afraid to knock on doors. The worst that can happen is a no, and you're in the same place you're in right now, right? And so um, professionally, I also recommend asking for feedback which for me is really uncomfortable. I hate, hate, hate being told what I'm doing wrong. Like it's actually the worst thing. But I want to know, right? Because I want to do better and I want to grow professionally. And so definitely having people in your life that will tell you truth and love and asking them um, what you can do better. And also in reaching out to people. So sorry, back to the conferences. I went to a few conferences for the first time and I would just walk up to people. Like if I heard a presentation I'd like, I'd walk up to them and be like, oh, wow, I'm an MPH student. This is really cool. How can I learn more? And people, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to talk to you and meet with you. For example, there's this really amazing researcher out in Houston who does Latin American health equity or San Antonio. Her name is um, Dr. Emily Ramirez. And I just emailed her. I was like, I really like your work. Can I learn more? And she met with me and I updated her last week that I got into a PhD program, even though we met a year ago. And so definitely don't be afraid to approach people that do similar work to you and just ask them about it. The worst they can say is no. And you'd be surprised at how many people say yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. People in public health, uh, a lot of people just love talking about themselves. Yeah. And about themselves. yeah. So yes, yes. It's true. Absolutely. It's true. Absolutely. Reach out to people. Um, but yeah. Awesome, awesome. And then last but not least, where can people connect with you, Jess? Yeah, um, so I'm on LinkedIn. Also on all the social medias, which another thing I'm working on is being on them less um, now that we brought it up. But <laughs> my email is also jotero at unc.edu. And so if anyone has any questions, wants to connect, is applying to doctoral programs, the doctoral process is so hard and so draining. And I'd love, and hopefully the future, I'll be able to put together a resource for people who are applying to doctoral programs. But until that is out, if people have questions about the MPH, community-based work, human design, doctoral things, anything else that I could help with, I'm always more than happy to respond to messages on LinkedIn, Instagram, email. Um, like, I'm always happy to share from what I've learned. I, in fact, would love for others to benefit from the things I've experienced to not have to go through some of the difficult things. Right. And I think like that, that is how we should be a resource to others and how yeah. people should use others as a resource is like learning from their mistakes, getting some guidance, getting some understanding. And I'll be sure to put those links below and uh, put your email as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing, sharing your story, your perspective, your insights and your journey up, up to now. Uh, look forward, probably have you back on in, in a couple of years or, so, or something of, of the sorts. So look forward to following your journey. Thank you so much for coming on, Jess.
Oh, thank you so much. Yes, happy to join anytime. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Housekeeping items, everyone. Thank you all so much for listening or watching to this listening or watching this appreciate you all be sure to subscribe if you have not as yet leave a like if you're watching this on youtube and leave a review let us know how you how you felt this episode and the show went and uh share us with a friend like there are so many ways to get involved in public health and sharing this is going to be helpful to someone out there so appreciate you all share it peace everyone